I was orchestrating a musical uh, in Boston, and a telegram arrived there at my hotel from Eddie Powell, who was one of the world's great orchestrators. He was working with Al Newman, Alfred Newman in Hollywood, and Al Newman was going to be the guy who conducted Modern Times. Alfred Newman was a man who had been a piano prodigy as a small boy, and he was indeed something quite remarkable. He studied with some very good teachers and all that sort of stuff, and eventually he turned out to be a fine conductor as well, and he conducted a lot of Broadway shows and got to be big stuff. So I can't remember who it was, one of the, one of the producers he worked with invited him to Hollywood. And uh, he came out here to conduct in films. And then he became a composer because they needed somebody. He was always very un uneasy about his composing because he couldn't persuade himself that he was really a composer, but he did do very splendid work. And uh, he was really, along with Max Steiner, the number one guy in Hollywood in the matter of music and uh, a really wonderful conductor. Anybody who looks at that picture, uh, who knows anything about synchronization, looks at modern times and sees the scene where Charlie goes crazy on the, when, where he's on the assembly line. Uh, it is one of the most extraordinary examples of conducting to something which is actually a comic ballet on the screen that you will ever see. It's a feat for which any conductor would be remembered. And Al Newman did that. But in any case, they wired me and they said they would like me to come out to Hollywood. And it was a great opportunity to work with Charlie and all the rest of that and uh, offered me a salary. I arrived by train at the Pasadena station and Eddie Powell and Herbie Spencer came out to meet me in Eddie's convertible. And when I got in that convertible and we wound up on Sunset Boulevard and I looked at the other convertibles with persons of another species in them, namely females, I realized I was in heaven. And uh, so we rode around, and then uh, Eddie took me to meet Alfred Newman, uh, who later turned out to have been offended by my first meeting with him because I was so enthusiastic that he thought it was gauche, you know. And I've later reflected that uh, it would be surprising to think of anyone who would not have been aroused to great uh, ridiculous thrills by the prospect of working with Charlie, because I'd you know, seen Charlie's movie since I was a little boy and loved everything he did. So uh, Al apparently thought that this was uh, beneath the dignity of a musician because I was waxing so enthusiastic or something. But nevertheless, they took me to see Charlie, and uh, he and I got along well. He ran the picture for me right away, uh, and I nearly fell apart when I saw it. When, I got, when we got to the feeding machine sequence, I laughed so hard I nearly fell off the seat. He said later he was wondering, before he really got to know me and know how independent I was, uh, whether I wasn't putting it on. Of course, I wasn't. But he also told me, uh, one of his friends, who was a playwright named Bayard Veillet, told me that Charlie said to him, I don't understand this. They tell you we've got this guy who's got all this experience and shows under his belt, and this infant walks in. But we started out by getting along very well, which deteriorated rapidly over the first week of work. Where our disagreement arose was this. We had different conceptions of what my job was. Charlie, you know, was a total autocrat. And the fact that he'd managed to survive all the negative things directed at him by people who were envious, including other producers and heads of studios and big money men, had his own studio and was the 100% complete boss of it, made him this kind of an autocrat. He was absolutely unused to having anybody dare to differ with him. And here I was, this, you know, brat who was saying to him, gee whiz, Charlie, I think we can do better than that when he'd come up with some tune unheard of. And after a little while, you know, he would reason with me, but he would, he would get mad. Well, I didn't understand just how mad, till one day I was informed by Eddie Powell that I was fired. This was after about a week. And that about broke my heart. I mean, uh, it's n impossible to describe what that does to you. And I was not uninfluenced by the fact that I would be going back to New York in disgrace. You know, he just got there and he lasted one week and that's the end of him. And I was, you know, really hurt because I thought Charlie and I had ar arrived at something. So uh, two nights before I was supposed to leave, I had my ticket and I had turned down uh, an offer of another job from somebody else. And uh, Eddie Powell and Herbie Spencer and Mrs. Powell 
took me to a restaurant called The Beachcomber, which used to be very famous in Hollywood in those days. And um, I was standing with them having one of their famous rum drinks, and, um, which I was ill-equipped to absorb. And all of a sudden, this thing came over me, and I realized I was about to fall apart. So I went and I stood in the doorway that looked out on the street, which had beads on it. It sounds like Sadie Thompson or something. And all of a sudden, somebody touched me. I turned around and looked, and I was looking over the head of a small man who turned out to be Alfred Newman. And he said to me, I've been looking at your sketches, meaning the ones I made, you know, of uh, Charlie's music and the tunes we worked on together. And this was, of course, the sketches which were timed to the film, which we did, by the way, if you'll remind me, uh, while watching the film on a projection movieola, which is different from what is usually done. Anyhow, Al says, I think they're absolutely marvelous. He'd be crazy to fire you. I got a call uh, uh, the next day from Alfred Reeves, who was this marvelous old gent who had worked in some vaudeville company with Charlie and was his confidant friend and ran the studio. And he was a darling man. He asked me if I'd come in. Of course, I was thrilled uh, to go back there. I went in, and he said they wanted to rehire me, wanted me to come back. And I said, I don't think so. Mr. Reeves, and he said, why, don't you like it here? I said, I love it here. I love working with Charlie, and I think everything he does is absolutely marvelous, but it would, the, the same thing would only recur again, unless we have an understanding. I said, I'd have to talk to him privately. So he arranged that, and Charlie met in his um, projection room, and we had a fairly long session, and well, it couldn't have been all that long, because I said to him, look, if you're looking for an amanuensis, you can buy one for nothing, a secretary. I said, if you're looking for another uh, hanger-on or acolyte, you got them by the dozens. They're all over the place, and nobody ever dares to say no or maybe to you. But if you're looking for someone who is willing to risk his job every day of the week to make sure that the music is, good, is as good as it can be and will not hesitate, to talk to you in this way, then I would be thrilled to come back. And he came over and swatted me on the shoulder, and that was that. And I went back to work for him. The way we worked together was this. Uh, he would come in in the morning, uh, about 9.30 or 10 o'clock every morning. He'd driv be driven in, in his limousine. And uh, I would be in my office, and Carter D. Haven Jr., who was uh, one of the assistants there, would dash into my office and say, He's here. That meant, of course, I should show up, which, of course, I did. I was always very eager to work with him. Well, you know, Charlie had no training in music, but he was a magpie who could pick up everything, everything. Charlie's mind was probably one of the most incredible attics in the history of human mentalities, and he had everything going for him. Well, he knew a, a good deal about music, and what he didn't know he would pick up from everybody. He picked up expressions, for instance. One of the things he used to say was vrubato, V-R-U-B-A-T-O. Well, the word, of course, is rubato. But when people say it, they sometimes accentuate the R by saying rubato. Charlie would say vrubato. And as I've written somewhere, uh, I always thought that after that that the word was much poorer without the V. Charlie couldn't write down music. He didn't know how to develop it. But when he was with somebody who did, he was unerring in his accuracy concerning what it was he wanted. Not only that, he picked up all kinds of things, and he was smart enough to say, I don't think the melody should go up here, meaning, you know, it should rise in the scale, it should go down, or it should stay right where it is, and let's do other things around it. He picked up things about instruments, and he really understood what they sounded like, which is, of course, what we musicians do all the time. We can talk on the phone, and I'll say, well, here I need three English horns. A real musician will know exactly what that means and what, how it differs from one. And um, Charlie would say to me, as he did in one case, now, I think we've played the melody enough in the upper register. Let's go down to the bottom register and play it somewhere. And he said, what about a trombone? This is, I'm sort of imagining, but it was very, very much like this. And I would say, Charlie, the trombone is not agile enough to play this phrase, and the horn has too feminine a sound, we want something stronger. And he'd say, well, gee whiz, what about a bassoon? I know I said, in, in a bassoon, which is a fine instrument, this would sound grotesque. And finally, we agreed on whose idea, I don't know uh, what it would be, on a tenor saxophone, you see? And it was one of those things where he would know the sound. 
See, I could just talk to him and he would have understood everything. And the funny part of it was, I took it for granted. I never said to myself, how does this guy know all this stuff? Remember that when I came out here, I had had no experience whatsoever with cinema, with film uh, synchronization, which is very, very precise. I had had a lot of experience with radio, doing background music for radio things uh, for CBS and other organizations in New York and in Philadelphia. Uh, but I'd had none whatsoever, so I was most fortunate in the way that he worked. Because what he would do was he had a projection movieola, which we used to call a Goldberg, not because it was a gadget like Rube Goldberg's do-it-yourself uh, monstrosities, but because it was made by the Goldberg brothers of Chicago. And it was a projection movieola, in other words, a projector that could go back and forth. So every time you stopped something, you didn't have to go back to the beginning of the reel, which you have had to do would have had to do with a real 35 projector. Well, we would run the sequence, meaning that there it was right in front of our nose, noses, and we would improvise on that. Charlie always had ideas. He would come in having given them some thought and would play something with one finger. And uh, uh, sometimes, I mean, uh, when I think back to the fact that I dared to contradict and oppose him at all. I think it sounds like a most uh, terrible example of chutzpah, you know, guts. But it wasn't. I was just acting out of instinct. Uh, but generally, I would like what he did, and then I'd say, well, Charlie, look, if we did this to it, uh, we could make it work this way. And I'd say, uh, sometimes I'd actually say, why don't you play those four notes? Like, for instance, the um, uh, scene, the first scene where you see Charlie working, uh, there, there's a little piece of thematic material there which consists of three notes repeated. Bum, 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 Now, when you're going to have eight minutes of that, something's got to happen to the music. So we would go through it and various things would happen. And Charlie, contrary to what people think, was not doing the whole thing by any means, but he was, nor was he not participating because he would actually talk about what should happen and what we should do, what curly cues, where we should get away from the tune and go to another tune. And that was the way we worked. And we would play the scene back and forth. And since I'm a very limited pianist, I believe, um, I would be able to play only parts of it. And we'd, we'd sing it, you know, and I'd play the accompaniment on the piano too. And we'd get it so it was exactly right and the bars were exactly right. Now, the sketches I made at that time were exceptionally rudimentary because you don't keep uh, God himself or one of his chief disciples uh, waiting while you make a complete sketch, which, you know, takes lots and lots of time. So I'd make a shorthand sketch with a melody on it. Any other idea that we had, suggestions as to scoring, uh, I mean, color, orchestral color, bass parts or anything like that. And then that night or on weekends when he was generally otherwise engaged, I would sit home and make a cleaner sketch. And those cleaner sketches were the ones from which Eddie Powell and I orchestrated. Charlie, you know, sometimes the ideas that uh, he would propose uh, were based on uh, various well, similarities to other pieces. Uh, sometimes they were very far from the uh, original piece, you know, but he had a great memory for all kinds of stuff. Uh, and at one time, there was a, a place where he said, a little Gershwin would be very nice here. Well, what he meant was he was not going to steal any of George Gershwin's music, but there is a place where there's a little secondary theme, which is clearly, which would never have happened without Rhapsody in Blue. It's not Rhapsody in Blue because otherwise it would have been a suit, but it was clearly based on that kind of thing, and it is fairly common among musicians to do this. Um, one time, for instance, we were working and we came to a place where we had to finally deal with, you should excuse the expression, the love theme, which exists between Charlie and the gammon, who was played by Madame Chaplin, Paulette Goddard. And uh, he said, a little um, Puccini would go very well here. Well, of course, the tune we came up with was not Puccini by anybody's means, but you can certainly see what he meant. It had that kind of... Uh, melodic, all-out expressiveness. The recording sessions were gala events. To begin with, we had such a large orchestra that we couldn't use uh, the United Artists Studios regular recording room, which 
good heavens, was big enough. We actually had at one point to move to another one. We had an orchestra of about 65 or 70, which included uh, the best virtuosi in Hollywood, which is saying the best virtuosi in the world and the best sight readers. And Charlie was always there, always dressed, you know, with his um, spats. Sometimes it was more informal, you know, but he dressed elegantly and all that and would sit around and would kid around a lot with the musicians. He admired them and understood what it took to be able to do what they were doing. And it was, of course, the greatest thing that could ever have happened to me. Imagine spending four and a half months with the greatest figure, I believe, in the history of films.